On September 29th of 2006, the police were called to Weston High School, located in Wisconsin. An active shooter was inside of the building, and what he did was disturbing. This is the case of Eric Hainstock. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also being a cashier at your local Walmart. I love my job. But today, we're going over the case of Eric Hainstock and what he did to his principal. You're going to learn about a deranged child who had a rough upbringing. For our story, we're heading to Casanova, Wisconsin. With an incredibly small population of only 362 people as of 2021, it's a village in Richland and Salt Counties. First entered in 1848 by a man named Alan Perkins, and by 1854, the first log house was erected by the Lincoln Brothers here. Honestly, if you're in the village, you're most likely passing through the area, or you're here for a purpose. There's really not much going on. You could visit the Car Valley Cheese Factory and take a tour, figure out how some cheese is made. If you're feeling like going on some bike trails with your trusty mountain bike, well, Wisconsin 400 State Trail is right here. Or you could go to Trail Break Pizza and get a nice old pie. Delicious. The sad thing is, though, is that none of these dandy options are the reason as to why we're in town today. On April 4th of 1991, Eric Hainstock was born to 20-year-old Sean Hainstock and 19-year-old Lisa Marie Butke. They got married a short time after, but divorced in November of 1993. Now from 1993 to 1996, Eric's father Sean was in and out of a mental health hospital for anger and depression issues. In April of 1995, after turning four years old, Eric was evaluated for kindergarten, but was found to be one to two years behind in language and other skills. He was then put on Ritalin after being diagnosed with ADHD. A few months later, and in August of 1995, Sean gained custody of Eric and took him off of Ritalin and took him out of therapy after only going once. And a few months after that, in December of 1995, Sean was dating a woman who filed a restraining order against him in order to protect her children. She said that Sean used frequent and severe spankings to discipline Eric. By March of 1996, Eric was still four years old and his father brought him to the Salt County Mental Health Unit for temper tantrums and inappropriate behaviors. A little over a year would pass and in April of 1997, Eric was six years old. He was attending elementary school and they gave him an evaluation. He had significant problems with inappropriate behavior, temper tantrums, and aggression. They said he'd often cry and hit himself, and at times he'd need to be physically restrained. This same month, Sean married a woman named Priscilla, and so now Eric would have a stepmother. For the past year or so, he was allowed visits to his actual mother, Lisa's house. She was married and had a stepson. Well, in July of 1997, a police report stated that Eric was being abused during those visits to his mother's house. The report also said that his mother's new husband would kick and hit him. As a result of this, Lisa was no longer allowed to see Eric. Only a few months later, and in September of 1997, Eric went to school with a split lip from his father. The school launched an abuse probe into Sean, but there wasn't substantial evidence. However, the authorities did deem Eric at risk, and so they referred Sean, Priscilla, and Eric to go to treatment services. They didn't fall through with going. Two months would pass, and in November of 1997, Eric's school would give him another evaluation. This time, he was described as desperate to please adults and was disruptive in class. His behavior had deteriorated since the year before. About two years would go by, and in the beginning of 1999, Eric's mother Lisa was sentenced to 60 days in jail for failure to pay child support. In February of 1999, Eric was now seven years old and getting worse. 
His school gave him another evaluation, and this time they found significant problems with anxiety, depression, hyperactivity, aggression, and social skills. By December of this same year, Eric ran away from home after being punished by his father. The police found him a little bit after midnight, sleeping on some bales of hay, cold and wet. He was taken to the emergency room and found to have a mild case of hypothermia. He told the police he does not want to live with his father and stepmother anymore. The next month, in January of 2000, Eric punched a student who took his hat and he knocked out one of the student's teeth. Two months later, and in March, Eric's mother Lisa terminated her parental rights. And so Priscilla, his stepmother, adopted him. Two more months, and in May, at age nine, a school nurse put Eric on a low dose of Ritalin. A school nurse did that, which I find very strange. They were allowed to do that? But Eric's behavior improved dramatically. He started to become well-behaved, polite, and respectful. However, he still had problems with impulse control and hyperactivity. By June, the medication stopped. In September of this same year, Eric and his family moved to Wanawak and he began fourth grade. He got into an altercation with a student and he ended up biting him. The day after this, he didn't come home from school and was found hiding in a public restroom. He was expressing fear about how his father would react to what he did. The next month, in October, Eric was prescribed Ritalin again and his grades and behavior dramatically improved. Unfortunately, however, the next year, in June of 2001, the school performed another progress report that said Eric, who was now 10 years old, stopped taking his medicine and began to fall down the same path. By the fall of this same year, September to be exact, the police were called to the Hainstock residence. Eric's father had kicked him several times for botching chores. They learned that Sean makes Eric hold hot sauce on his tongue and he hits him with a paddle marked Board of Education. Sean told the authorities that they can keep his son. Eric was removed from the household and placed with Irene Hainstock, Sean's mother. Sean was charged with felony child abuse. This was later reduced to misdemeanor battery and eventually dismissed. That's absolutely wild. But the story is just beginning. Still in the fall of 2001, and Eric's behavior was really deteriorating. He was constantly disrupting class, having nightmares with fears of dying, and also making threats of committing the end game. In October, he kicked another student, and he got suspended from school for bringing powdered magnesium, saying that it was... By winter, Eric was still with his grandmother, and he began taking Ritalin again. His behavior started to improve, and so did his school performance. Unfortunately, however, only a few months would pass, and in April of 2002, Sean Hainstock regained custody of Eric, who was now 11 years old. In September of this same year, Eric transferred to Weston Schools to start attending 6th grade. By April of 2003, Eric was now 12 years old. A review of him found him to have a severe attention deficit problem that needs to be addressed through medication, but his father and stepmother objected to him receiving it. For the next year, all the way through 2004, Eric had multiple detentions in school and was removed from classrooms on average two times a week. He ended up having to repeat the sixth grade. The Saw County officials received two neglect referrals from the school. One, because Eric came to the school shirtless and he said it was because he stayed up late doing chores. Another one deemed him to be filthy and smelly. The neglect wasn't substantiated, however, and so it was just let go. Now we're in March of 2005 and Eric is in the seventh grade, but academically, he's at about a fourth to fifth grade level and has problems with learning, behavior, and depression. His father and stepmother opposed any type of counseling or any other type of treatment. Sean said that Eric was doing better with discipline. The next year in 2006 is where we're at now and where the story proceeds. As you can tell from what you've already heard, Eric's life has been nothing but hardships from the time that he was born, but you've only really learned some of it. Eric's father, Sean, was not only physically abusive, but also mentally as well. 
Sean called Eric names like and made him stand in the corner with his nose touching the wall while holding one leg up for very long periods of time. Eric's stepmother, Priscilla, wasn't any better. Her and Eric constantly got into it. Eric said that both of them would beat him, kick him, slap him, and throw things at him. Sean would force Eric to hold hot sauce and peppers in his mouth, which Eric said burned so badly he couldn't breathe or swallow. Sometimes Sean would make Eric run laps in the yard for hours, and he wasn't allowed to stop to urinate. He'd have to pee his pants or pee while he was running. Eric was made to do most of the chores, which included cleaning, sometimes until late at night. He was forced to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches while his family would eat steaks in front of him. Oftentimes, he would be hungry at school because his dad wouldn't pay the 30 cents a day for a reduced price school lunch. Also, around this time, Sean took Eric off of Ritalin because he didn't want to pay the money for it. Eric was wearing clothes and shoes that didn't fit him, and he was only allowed to shower once to twice a week. They made him stand out at school because he would smell bad, but school wasn't any better. By this time, Eric was 14 years old and in 8th grade. He said there was never, not once, a good day at Weston, that it was hell. In February, the police were called to his school after Eric became angry at another student and a teacher and started throwing chairs around. But here's what he was dealing with. Eric at the time identified as bisexual, and so he was into dating either men or women. He was more on the feminine side and acted like a girl, and so people constantly harassed him. They'd call him names like f gay boy, girly boy, punk, and sissy, and every day it was the same thing. They'd call him names in the hall, in class, at lunch, before school, and after. The teachers all knew this, but they didn't stand up for him or say anything. It even got to the point of it being physical. Eric would be slapped, hit all over his body, pushed into bushes, thrown to the ground, and people would give him swirlies up to three times a day. He complained to school officials, including and specifically the principal John Kling. He told them two to four times a week, every week, every year, and nothing was ever done. Even Eric's father, Sean, tried to complain to the school about it, but he got a disorderly conduct. The thing is, though, it wasn't just one or two students doing this. It was nearly 30 kids at Weston who bullied him. By fall of 2006, Eric Hainstock was 15 years old and just became a freshman at Weston High School. On September 14th, Eric got into a fight with another student and then threw a stapler at a teacher. He was charged with second degree recklessly endangering safety, disorderly conduct, and criminal damage. A few days would pass and Eric got into a fight with a stepmother and she bit his chest and arm and she wasn't charged for this. On September 28th, he got into trouble with the principal, John Klang, for having tobacco at school. Eric would go home that day and concoct a plan. He was so tired and enraged of everything he was dealing with. The next day, on September 29th of 2006, would change absolutely everything. During this morning, Eric woke up especially angry and wanting revenge. He took his father's 22 caliber revolver and 20 gauge shotgun out of a locked gun cabinet. Then he missed the school bus, and so he siphoned gas from their lawnmowers and put it into the family truck. He then stole the truck, and he wasn't old enough to drive by himself. Eric decided to drive to school for the first time and didn't even know how to shift the gears he learned on his way. His initial plan was to go into school and to tell the principal, John Klang, to tell everyone to stop bullying him and also take a bunch of people out. At about 8 a.m., Eric entered the school's main hall and aimed the shotgun at a social studies teacher. A heroic custodian named Dave Thompson wrestled the gun away from Eric as soon as he noticed what was going on. Eric then ran down the hallway, only to be confronted by the principal, John Klang. They got into an altercation, and Eric grabbed the pistol from his jacket, firing several shots, hitting John three times. John still ended up being able to get the gun away from Eric and keep him wrestled to the ground. Police would arrive on the scene very shortly after arresting Eric. 
John was rushed to the hospital where he underwent surgery before he was flown to another hospital about 50 miles away. He died only a few minutes before 3 p.m. What an absolutely heartbreaking story. Eric was charged as an adult, and on August 3rd of 2007, he was sentenced to life in prison with his first eligibility for parole in 2037. What he did was terrible, to say the least, especially to an innocent man. Eric suffered a horrendous life growing up, and honestly, everyone around him failed him. He should have been taken away from his father and never have been given back. I'm not sure how after all of those incidents, Sean could possibly regain parental custody. That's a failure in the court's part to do justice. However, nothing justifies cold-blooded murder, so Eric is right where he belongs, and he can stay there continuing to make cookbooks. He also said that he likes it there better, so good. John Klang was a hero, a one-of-a-kind type of man. Who knows the potential of what would have happened if he didn't stop Eric? He was married to a woman named Susan, and together they had three children. Up until 2003, John was employed at a dairy farmer while attaining his master's degree in school administration. In 2004, he ended up becoming the principal of Weston High School and the district administrator for the Weston School District. John loved being outdoors, often going for long walks and photographing wildlife. He was a fisherman and an avid hunter, a churchgoer, and an all-around family man. He's greatly missed and I hope wherever he's at, he's resting peacefully. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.